All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I do apologize for the issues with the live stream. Uh, something I need to look into a little bit more. Um, so, unfortunately, this is going to be recording. Uh, but I do want to go ahead and uh, just get started for today. Uh, so, if you remember last class, we picked up with Chapter 4, covering a lot of the theoretical concepts in information security. Uh, this class is going to be a little bit different. We're going to cover a little bit more uh, practical concepts. Uh, so, just kind of looking through here, I've got an Excel spreadsheet we're going to be in. We're also going to be inside this Word document, as well as a couple slides from the PowerPoint. So uh, certainly make sure you go to Canvas and download those. Uh, but basically, this first worksheet inside this workbook uh, goes through some different cases. So you know the different types of malware, different uh, security threats, all those sorts of things are going to be covered inside of this uh, document right here. So I'm just going to briefly go through some of these stories. Um, you know, recently there was a large Equifax breach, which uh, is estimated to, I believe now, uh, cover more than a billion in damages, just direct damages, um, you know, notifying people, uh, settlements, regulatory. Uh, so it's a pretty big breach. And one of the interesting things about the Equifax story is not necessarily that it happened, but that it was preventable. Uh, so Equifax was uh, allegedly running uh, software that had been patched yet they didn't run the proper patches to protect against the vulnerabilities. So that's certainly a, an unfortunate thing that happened, and you know, with that in mind, it's important to make sure that you maintain the software. Um, then, of course, uh, the Health and Human Resources uh, Services, HHS, has all the different healthcare breaches that affect more than 500 people. So you can see here, uh, there's been quite a few uh, you know, just kind of scrolling through. These are within, I think, the past two years, they've had 714. Uh, so that's quite a few. If we sort by individuals affected, uh, we'll see there's been some pretty large breaches. So um, we should be able to sort by individuals affected. Let's see. There we go. Yeah, so this is, uh, looks like that's 11,500,000 people uh, were affected by a hacking incident. I mean, it's quite a large um, you know, amount there. Uh, this next story um, is archiving right now, but basically uh, it's from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it goes through some ransomware in business, just kind of talking about some various occurrences of ransomware where very important information was basically held at a ransom. Uh, it was encrypted and was not decrypted without any sort of uh, interaction. So you had to basically pay the ransom to get the uh, information decrypted. So could be very harmful to businesses. However, it's very easy to uh, mitigate that because if you have proper backups in place, uh, you're not going to lose more than a day's worth of information. So that can certainly be something to keep in mind is that you know good backup practices can avoid a lot of the downfalls of ransomware. Now, in terms of avoiding ransomware itself, uh, you know, certainly having things like um, you know, some sort of appliance that checks your emails, make sure that you're not allowing any sort of unauthorized software to be run on machines. Uh, but certainly, you know, the best mitigation is just going to be a good backup. Uh, so here's another story uh, about a large amount of the uh, email scams that were been taken down a couple years back, actually. Uh, this is from the FBI. Uh, they basically took down some servers that were responsible for sending out a lot of uh, spam emails to various uh, parties. Uh, I think it's in the ballpark of like billions of emails a year were sent out via this. So certainly that's an interesting thing. Uh, you look at the economic impact. Uh, this is you know talking in the uh, tens of billions per year uh, that people fall for these. So pretty interesting to consider. Uh, this next example here is uh, one of the few examples. That I'm aware of, at least in the wild, of a honeypot attack. So basically, a honeypot attack is simply uh, when you have some sort of a wireless access point that masquerades as a legitimate wireless access point, but in reality, it is not. So what happened was at the RNC convention in 2016, uh, there was a group that actually put up these honeypots, and they were doing it to sniff out traffic, which is illegal and certainly unethical. Uh, not condoning it at all, also not commenting on any politics, but this is certainly something that um, you know, took place and it's an interesting story to read into a little bit, um, just from a security standpoint. The uh, main way to avoid a honeypot attack would be to use certificate-based uh, wireless authentication. So basically, you know, not only do you have, of course, you know, the 802.1x encryption for the uh, user itself, but beyond that, 
Um, you know, the only way that a device recognizes a network is by the name of the network. Nothing's stopping anyone from making whatever network name they want. So uh, to avoid that sort of issue, what they could do is um, use a certificate. So if the device doesn't have the certificate that it's connecting to, it will not connect. So that's a way to get around that. Not so practical for public Wi-Fi though, because you have to get their certificate in the first place. So certainly keep that in mind. Uh, and then lastly, this is one of the largest breaches involving the U.S. government, was the uh, 2015 OPM attack. So I believe this was in the ballpark of about 11 million uh, OPM records, which of course are government records, uh, a lot of military records as well, uh, that were breached. So certainly it can happen to anyone, uh, regardless of any measures that take place. Of course, measures certainly uh, prevent that. Okay, so with that out of the way, uh, we're going to go back to uh, talking about some different layers of security. So last class, we talked a lot about different types of threats. We talked about some basic ways to mitigate them. But that's kind of taking the perspective of it being, you know, you take one approach and you're safe. It's not really the case, though. Uh, in reality, we can think of security as being more of a uh, something that if one single fail point occurs, you know, we have a breach. So imagine if we had, you know, full encryption, we had the best application security, we had pretty good everything, except we had a physical security problem. Someone could come into an organization, they could steal our server physically, and then what happens? Uh, there's going to be, of course, a pretty substantial problem because we can no longer access the information. We think back to the CIA triad, we want to have not only confidentiality and integrity, but also availability. So if someone can steal the physical hardware that we're storing our information on, we don't have any of the, um, we don't have any security because there's no amount of availability there. So certainly keep that in mind. It's important to have a layered approach and each layer is equally important in securing the organization's resources. So, you know, at the central level here, we have the mission critical assets. That's going to be the organizational resources. That's going to be our information. That's going to be what we're storing that we don't want to have leaked out, that we want to have available to people, but only to the right people. Um, also that we have it correct. So we have data security. Of course, we want to make sure the data itself is secure. But then the applications that are on our network, that are on our devices, we want to make sure those are secure as well. Uh, individual endpoints, anything using it, you know, a smartphone, it could be a desktop, laptop, a server, anything like that that's an endpoint, we want to make sure that is secure. Uh, the network itself, we want to have proper network security, use things like um, firewalls, of course, uh, maybe demilitarized zones, uh, whatever we can to make sure that we're keeping, you know, the network itself secure. Uh, because, of course, the network, if we have a wireless network, it can certainly easily uh, extend beyond the walls of our building. And we have to make sure that we have proper protocols in place to ensure that we don't have any sort of breaches of information. Uh, and then lastly, perimeter security. That is the physical layer. So, you know, each of these layers are very important. And, you know, just having good security in some or just a few of these is not enough. Uh, so it's certainly not going to uh, do us very good. Now I'm going to shift gears a little bit now and go to the PowerPoint. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, switch over to that. So uh, we didn't cover anything about risk. So we left off with auditing. So I'm just going to lecture a little bit over risk, just a couple minutes here. So the whole concept is, is that, you know, no matter what we do, there's always going to be some level of risk. Uh, we can't mitigate something perfectly. Um, now, of course, for this class, we will assume that we can, but in the general sense, you really can't. Uh, there's always, there's never going to be a probability of zero. There's never going to be a probability of one. It's always going to be somewhere in between those two. Uh, but certainly, we can take actions to make things less likely to occur. So that's certainly going to be something very advantageous when we're talking about this from a security aspect. Because the whole goal is we want to make sure that we're not going to have any sort of harm that we can't overcome. So, uh, of course, with that in mind, one of the sort of tenets of risk management is that we do this in a, in a sort of a, a reasoned way. We don't just want to go and you know implement every single thing and lock our organization completely down because then it makes it impossible to do business and it's also going to be very costly. Uh, so we want to do this in a very measured, uh, sane approach. So basically, you know, we have a risk and it has some likelihood that it will occur. 
be it one percent of the time, be it a hundred percent, well, be it ninety-nine percent of the time, whatever the case is, we want to, uh, generally speaking, we want to minimize our risk. But to do that, we have to use risk management. So of course, for risk management, we want to see what the risks are. Uh, that's a very important step that we take a look and we see what is likely to happen. And then, of course, we say, what can we do to adjust the likelihood? Uh, what's that going to cost for us to do that? Um, you know, certainly the cost is going to be a very big component of this because, like I said, it doesn't make sense to harm your business uh, more by risk management than you would without risk management. Uh, and then lastly, you know, if it makes sense to do so, you minimize the threats. If it doesn't make sense to do so, you don't. So for risk analysis, you really, uh, first one of the things you want to do is see what assets you think are likely to be damaged and what they're worth. Uh, so you can do that a lot of different ways. This is not a class where you have to know how to uh, assess the value of an asset. Uh, it's going to be given in all the problems in here. But generally speaking, there's going to be a lot of different ways you could do this. Uh, typically, from an accounting standpoint, you'd use some sort of a depreciation uh, approach. And based upon that, that's how you would determine the value of the asset. So a little bit beyond the scope of this course. But you know, certainly, then you want to see how likely is it that something will happen to it. And of course, you'd also define what that something would be. Uh, but again, both of those are going to be given in here. Um, the probability is something that could be very difficult to calculate. Um, there's certainly lots of different approaches. Um, like I say, it is beyond this course. But what's not beyond this course is comparing the cost of that. So basically, what we're going to do is we're going to see what's the probability of loss times the asset's value. And that's going to be the cost of the loss. And then we're going to have the probability of the protection times the cost of protection times the value of the asset. Let's see which one of those is going to be a better value for us. So let's run through a quick example. I think examples can kind of make this a lot easier to understand. So imagine we have a million dollar asset and if something happens to it, we'll lose 80% of that. So right off the bat, you know that the, the cost of the loss itself is going to be 800000 and the residual value of the asset after the loss will be 200000 and this is going to have a 10% likelihood of occurrence. So that means that in any given year, we're going to estimate the expected value is going to be this 10% uh, times how much we're going to lose. So we're going to lose $800,000 in value. So in other words, the uh, annualized cost of occurrence here is going to be $800,000 because we just take that 10% uh, times the uh, cost of occurrence, which is 800000 Now we could uh, engage in protection. So this protection would cost 10000 per year. In this example, we're going to assume it's for 10 years. So we're going to take that uh, uh, 10000 divided by 10 gives us uh, $1,000 per year. That's the uh, annualized cost, rather. So, And then, of course, if we assume that this completely eliminates the risk, which is a pretty bold assumption, not realistic, but for this class is fine, um, unless you're given the information otherwise, then that leaves you with comparing an $80,000 annualized cost of occurrence to a $1,000 cost of protection. In this case, it makes more sense to take the protection because the annualized cost of occurrence at $80,000 is substantially higher than the annualized cost of protection at $1,000 per year. So you certainly want to keep that in mind. Uh, and with this approach, though, there's going to be four major ways that we can sort of uh, you know, go about this risk. So we can accept the risk. So we can understand what the risk is. We can say these are the facts of it. You know, we're fine with it. We don't have any objections. And that's one approach. Another approach would be risk transference. Uh, this is basically insurance. So with insurance, what we're doing is we're taking the risk. We're saying, yes, we have these risks. We acknowledge them. Um, rather than accepting them or doing anything to mitigate them ourselves, we're going to basically have a third party do that for us. So the third party works like they have lots of different clients and the goal is for them to have uh, the risk kind of spread across different firms, different people, whatever the case may be, as opposed to having it burdened to one specific individual. And of course with a lot of types of insurance, um, it's going to be priced in a way to where it will be enticing to an individual or to a firm, yet it will be um, still advantageous to the insurance provider. Because um, if it's not advantageous to the insurance provider, why would they offer it? Uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. 
So risk limitation would be like in this example right here, where we're going to take the protection. We're going to take steps to mitigate the risk to hopefully reduce the likelihood and to reduce the overall cost of whatever we're dealing with. And then the last option is to ignore eject risk. I forgot this, uh, this bird here. I'm not sure what type of bird it is. Uh, it may be a dodo, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, basically, in this approach, you, know, you don't go through the risk analysis at all. You, know, you just say, oh, it's not there, and you just move on. Uh, generally speaking, that's an ill-advised approach. Risk acceptance can be fine. Uh, risk transference can certainly make a lot of sense. Risk limitation can make a lot of sense. But generally speaking, ignoring or just rejecting risk is not going to be the most advantageous approach. So uh, now let's shift the gears back to the Excel file. Got some basic risk analysis problems I'm going to run through. So you know, when I think about risk analysis, I like to think about it can be a little complicated, but not so complicated if you think about it in the perspective. All you're trying to do is compare the cost of taking an action or not taking an action. So it's like if you're at the store and you're buying a can of beans. You know, One can of beans versus another can of beans could be pretty similar. Uh, of course, you could just compare the price for the cans. Now, of course, an issue with that is different cans may be different sizes. So you're not comparing the same units. So one of the ways you can do that is to use unit price per whatever uh, unit. So typically looking at cans, it's going to be a unit price per ounce. And if you compare the unit price per ounce from one can to another, you are comparing the same units. So all we're trying to do here is get the same units. So these units are going to be the annualized cost of occurrence and the annualized cost of protection. So basically what we're doing is we're saying we have an asset value right here of 5 million. We have a cost of occurrence of uh, 2.5 million. So that means that we're going to reduce the value of the asset by 2.5 million from 5 million. So to figure out what the residual value is, all we have to do is take this asset value, subtract off the cost of occurrence, it's going to give us another 2.5 million. And likelihood of occurrence right here is given as 4%. That means that in any uh, given year, it's 4% chance that this is going to occur. So well, all we have to do to figure out the annualized cost of occurrence here is just calculate the expected rate, which is going to be this 4% times the cost of occurrence, which is 2.5 million. So that gives us that at any given year, the expected annualized cost of occurrence is going to be $100,000. Uh, so in this case, it uh, looks like the annual protection cost is not given. I'll just put in one, 90000 So decision, since the annualized, I'm not going to write all this out for now. Um, I'm just going to say, go with protection. Uh, because the protection cost is less than the annualized cost of occurrence here. Uh, if this were, say, 110000 we would, of course, accept the risk and do nothing. Let's see another example here. So we have an asset value given still $5 million, but the destruction percentage is going to be 85%. So what that means is that if something happens, we're going to lose 85% of the asset value. So to calculate the residual value, all we have to do is take this uh, asset value and then just multiply it by 1 minus the destruction percentage because that's what's going to be remaining. If we take 100% minus 85%, it's going to give us 15%. So we're just going to take 1 minus 15% and that's going to give us $750,000. So for that's the residual value. That's what's left over after whatever happens, happens. So to calculate the cost of occurrence, all we have to do is take the asset value subtract off the residual. And that of course gives us uh, 4.25 million. Okay, so we know this is gonna be 5% likely to occur or we're gonna have 4.25 uh, million in loss. So for the annualized cost, all we have to do is just take this likelihood of occurrence times the cost of occurrence. That's gonna annualize the cost for us. Gives us 212,500. So in this case we have, it looks like the annual, the total protection cost is going to be uh, 1 million for 10 years. So we want to get the annual protection cost of that. So all we have to do is take the protection cost divided by the amount of periods that we're going to have it for. So in this case, the annual cost is going to be uh, 1 million divided by uh, 10, which of course is going to give us 100,000. So in this case, we're going to go with protection. Now imagine if this uh, protection cost were not 1 million, but let's say it was 3 million for 10 years. 
So what we do is we take that 3 million divided by 10 gives us 300,000. Since 300,000 is larger than 212,500, we would then do nothing and accept the risk. But in this case, we're going to keep it nice and simple and just go with that protection. And it looks like I misspelled protection here. Okay, so now let's go to one uh, couple more examples here, then we'll switch over to the Word document. So we have an asset value of $5 million, destruction percentage of 50% of, uh, and a residual value of $2.5 uh, million. And of course, cost of occurrence is also going to be $2.5 million, so we're just going to take this and uh, subtract off the residual value to get the cost of occurrence. So pretty straightforward there. Uh, like the last example, we have a 5% likelihood of occurrence. So annualized cost, again, we take the cost of occurrence. We're just going to multiply it by the likelihood right here. And that gives us 1.25, uh, or just 125,000. So the uh, protection cost here is going to be uh, 1 million for 10 years. So for the annual protection cost, just like the previous example, um, it's just going to be uh, 1 million divided by 10 gives us, of course, 100,000. So go with protection. Okay, last example in this Excel worksheet. Uh, pretty similar to the last one. So again, asset value. Now we have a destruction percentage of 50%. So we're just going to take the asset value times 50%. Of course, uh, realistically, we shouldn't have done it that way, but because it's 50%, it works fine. What we should have instead done is take the asset value times the destruction percentage uh, to get the cost of occurrence there, uh, because that's what's going to actually be damaged. Um, so if this were anything other than 50%, uh, what we just did would not work. Instead, we would have to do times 1 minus. Uh, and that's going to give us the same thing, because you know we have uh, 0.5. We take 1 minus 0.5. It's still going to be 0.5. But for any other value, that does not hold true. Um, so uh, it's just a quick little aside there. So if we made this say, let's say, thirty percent, you know, this is going to change the problem. So if we left that the same, we would have something that doesn't add up to the asset value there. So we want to keep that in mind and not have any sort of issues with that. Okay. So we know that the cost of occurrence is one point five million. The likelihood is going to be five percent. So all we have to do is take 1.5, multiply that by uh, 5%, it gives us 7,500. Of course, we have 1 million uh, for 10 years, so we take that 100,000. Uh, annualized cost of occurrence with protection. So this is going to be a little bit different than some of the previous problems. I tried to add in something new, each one of these examples. So before, we assumed that we took the annualized cost of occurrence with the protection to zero. But in this case, we're not taking it to zero. We're taking it to a hundred uh, to a uh, thousand dollars per year. Uh, it's annualized cost of occurrence with the protection. So without the protection, the annualized cost of occurrence is seventy-five thousand. With the uh, protection, it's going to be uh, one thousand. So a pretty drastic reduction, but it's not an elimination. So to calculate this, what we need to do is we need to take the annual protection cost plus the annualized cost of occurrence with protection. To compare because otherwise we're not comparing the same thing. If we just compare annualized cost of occurrences, then it's going to make a lot more sense to go with the uh, protection. But in this case, that's not the entirety of the cost. So we have to add in both of these costs, get a hundred thousand uh, and uh, another thousand, so a hundred one thousand. Let me uh, speak a little bit more clearly there. Hundred one thousand for the total annualized cost of protection, plus uh, compared to the 75,000. So in this case, our decision is going to be accept risk and do nothing. Okay, so just want to make sure that's clear to everyone. We can certainly have additional uh, cost of occurrences after we have the um, protection. So, you know, this is kind of a basic examples here to get everything going. Uh, on the test, you'll probably be a lot more likely to see problems like what I have in these Word documents here. So let me take a sip of water and then we'll just go ahead and read this. All right. So the problem reads, business firm Clearwater has an infrastructure in place that is valued at $1 million. As it is, if the facility is hit with a fire, the value will decrease by $800,000. This is expected to happen ev once every 100 years. A fire suppression system will cost the firm $250,000 
with annual operating cost of $10,000. Fire suppression system will last for 25 years and will not cause and will cause any fire to only cause $100,000 of damage with the same likelihood of occurrence. What should clear water do? So, just kind of reading this problem again, we see that the value is a million dollars and the cost of occurrence, as with doing nothing, is going to be $800,000. And we see once every 100 years, that is to say 1% of years. So. We can go ahead and uh, get this information. Let's just go ahead and do this. Cost of occurrence is going to be equal to $800,000. And the likelihood is going to be equal to 1%. So now, annualized cost of occurrence be equal to cost of occurrence, which is 800,000, times 1%, which is of course going to give us our good friend $8,000. Okay, so that's doing nothing. Now let's see what happens if we do something. So the fire suppression system has an initial upfront cost of 250,000. Let's make this green. Annual operating cost of 20 of uh, not 20, of uh, 10,000 for 25 years. And now it's going to change the cost of occurrence to 100,000. So, what should they do? Well, let's go ahead and just see here. So, we have initial cost of protection, it's going to be equal to uh, 250,000. And now that's not all we have to do to have this protection. We also have to spend $10,000 every year for 25 years. And after that, everything we invested is gone because it's only going to last for 25 years. So we want to get the total uh, operating cost here of protection. Going to be equal to, uh, again, $10,000. Whoops, not 20. $10,000 times 25 years equals, uh, that is of course going to give us a good friend, 250000 So now we want to get the annual operating cost of protection. Okay, so all we have to do then is take this uh, 250000 and what we're going to do now is just add this in. And we'll go ahead and call this total annual operating. We'll just call this total cost of protection. So it's going to be an annualized number. So we're just going to take in this initial upfront cost of 250000 We're going to add it in to our operating costs, which are also coincidentally 250000 And then we're going to divide this by 25 years because this system only lasts for 25 years. So ultimately, this is going to give us total annual cost of protection of $20,000 because we're taking 500,000 dividing it by 25. Okay, so we're not done yet though uh, because in this example, we have a new cost of occurrence of $100,000. So initially, we had the cost of occurrence with doing nothing at $800,000. Now it's reduced to 100,000. And the likelihood of occurrence does not change because, you know, if a fire suppression system doesn't make it less likely the fire starts, it makes it more likely the fire is put out before causing substantial damage. So we're just going to change, copy that down, and we have a new annualized cost of occurrence. I do apologize for the, uh, mic quality. I left my microphone in my office and I also left my nice camera in my office. A lot of stuff in my office. So I uh, was not anticipating being out for a snow day this long. So uh, I apologize for any sort of quality issues. We also apologize again for not being able to live stream. Uh, so we're just going to take this cost of occurrence right here times the likelihood of occurrence, which we just found to not change. So, uh, $100,000 cost of occurrence times 1% gives the expected value of $1,000. Okay, 
So now we have two annualized costs. What we want to do is get the total annualized cost with protection. And all we have to do here is just go ahead and add in our $20,000 that we calculated up here. We're going to take that and we're just going to add in the $1,000 from down here. So we're just adding in those two annualized costs and that's going to be the total cost. So that's going to give us, of course, $21,000. Now, uh, we're done, but we're not quite done. Whoops. So what we want to do is we want to see which one of these is going to be more advantageous for our firm. Do we want to spend $8,000 per year or do we want to spend $21,000 per year? So in this case, we're going to ignore any sort of uh, exogenous variables, anything that's you know external that we're not accounting for, like regulations, uh, ethics, goodwill, all that stuff we're just ignoring. We're just comparing two numbers here. So since the annualized cost of protection without or annualized cost of occurrence rather without protection is eight thousand and less than the annualized cost with protection at twenty one thousand and I'll fix that typo in a little bit here we would do nothing and accept the risks. Because again, we're just comparing those two annualized numbers there. All this is really saying is we want to make sure that we're doing what's best for our firm, ignoring everything else. Now, in a real risk analysis, you wouldn't actually ignore everything else, but it can be very difficult to... Uh, you know, like I said, it's a very sort of high level concept. We're not gonna go in that much in depth in this course with risk analysis. Okay, so let's see another example here. So this example reads, Grandpa's Pizza hosts a website. If the website is attacked, his organization, uh, the total cost of his organization is $50,000. Currently, Grandpa has no protection against such threats and therefore an attack is likely to occur 56 times per day. A consultant will provide security that will reduce the occurrence to only occur at once every 10 years. A consultant will charge 7500 per year for the service. What should Grandpa do? So I think I probably have one uh, question on the exam where you can look at it. You can tell, you know, no way would you ever uh, not take protection. This is one of those examples because $50,000, we're going to have that happen 56 times per day. Uh, that's a lot. And, you know, that's going to happen in a total year. That's going to happen 56 times, 365.25 times per year. So that's going to be a massive number. Uh, I can guarantee a Grandpa's Pizza is not going to be able to cover that. Uh, but for this example, let's just run through it real fast. So we have cost of occurrence. It's given to us as 50000 Let me grab some water. $50,000 cost of occurrence and likelihood of occurrence is going to be uh, 20,440 times per year. So the annualized cost of occurrence, we know that it costs $50,000 uh, 50, every time it occurs and it's estimated to occur uh, 20,000 440 times per year. So we're just going to take this occurrence, multiply it by 50,000 to see what the annualized cost is going to be. And uh, as you make a guess, it's going to be quite a large number. So that's going to be uh, 1 billion, uh, 22 million, uh, you know, money that grandpa probably doesn't have. <laughs> so, you know, we're going to do that. And now let's see, you know, is there anything we could do to avoid this situation? Well, of course. Uh, so a consultant will provide security every 10 years. That's going to be the new cost. Uh, that's going to be the new likelihood of occurrences every 10 years. So in other words, 10% of years. Uh, because if something occurs once every 100 years, this course is going to be 1% of years. So 
Salt will charge 7500 per year for this service. Okay, so we have new annual protection cost. Given is 7500 per year. Whoops. And we have a new likelihood of occurrence. It's given as 10% because once every 10 years is the same as saying 10%. So all we have to do then is take that 10% and now we want to calculate the new annualized cost of occurrence. Whoops. So we're just going to take this uh, 7500 and uh, so for the annualized cost of occurrence, actually, we're just going to take this 10%, rather. Let's so take this 10%, and we know the cost of occurrence didn't change. So we can just multiply that by 50,000. Because, you know, the consultant's not going to change what will be affected. They're just going to change how likely it is that it's affected in this case. So we take that, and we're going to get $5,000. Okay, so now we want to get the total annualized cost with protection. And that's going to be equal to, of course, 7,500 because it's annual protection cost plus the annualized cost of occurrence with the protection. So that's going to be 5,000. So we just add these two together. That gives us, of course, 12,500. Okay. So what should our good friend Grandpa do? Well, since the annualized cost of occurrence is a billion dollars <laughs> without protection grandpa should use the protective services to realize Something like that. Uh, again, on the test, everything's multiple choice. You'll basically just be answering which one is more advantageous for the firm. You won't have to give the description, but I think it makes a lot of sense to give a description. So, um, like I said, that's pretty much how you do that. Basically, just comparing the two annual costs. There. Let's do one more example for today. Uh, Yippee Yarn You Love has a customer database which it currently protects using reasonable measures. If compromised, they'll lose 25,000 in business and pay 75,000 in restitution. So 25,000 in business and 75,000 in restitution. This will happen every 20 years. So we know that we have uh, every 20 years, in other words, 5% of years. In addition to this, consultants offer to provide additional services they claim will reduce the probability of occurrence to once every 100 years, so 1% of years, at an upfront cost of 10000 upfront for software licensing and 1000 up uh, every year for maintenance. Uh, agreement is 10 years. Okay, what should Yippee Yarn You Love do? Uh, change their name. <laughs> No, they should have changed your name. Uh, so basically, we have right now doing nothing. We have cost of occurrence of twenty-five thousand plus seventy-five thousand. So we're just going to take twenty-five thousand dollars, add it into seventy-five thousand dollars, and that's all we have to do. And that's going to give us, of course, a cost of a hundred thousand dollars. And we know it's going to happen. Uh, basically uh, every 20 years, so likelihood of occurrence is going to be equal to uh, 1 divided by 20, uh, which of course is just going to give us a good friend of uh, 5%. So the annualized, whoops, I cannot type today, it's just going to equal 5% times 
the $100,000 cost of occurrence, which is going to be equal to $5,000. Okay, let me just correct this quick little typo here. Okay, so $5,000 is not half bad. Uh, but let's see what else we can do. So we have annualized cost, or getting a little bit ahead of myself there. So we have initial upfront cost of $10,000. So upfront cost of protection is gonna be equal to $10,000. Okay, and we know this is going to be $1,000 every year, so we have annual cost of protection, not to be confused with annualized, it's given as $1,000. So we have basically lifetime operating cost of protection going to be equal to the annual cost times how long it's going to last for. So in this case, it's going to be 10 years. So $1,000 times 10 is, of course, going to give us $10,000. Okay, so uh, we're not done yet, though, because we want to then calculate the uh, total cost of protection. So the total cost of protection is going to be the upfront cost plus the operating cost over the lifetime. So we're just going to take 10,000 plus 10,000 because both of those are 10,000 just to make things nice and simple. Um, you know, I do like keep the numbers nice and simple on exams. Uh, back when they were in person, I didn't let anyone use a calculator. So you should be able to work it out by pen and paper at worst. But generally speaking, you probably should be able to do a lot of the math in your head. Uh, so we're just going to take that. It's going to give us, of course, 20,000. Uh, now, of course, we know that we need to annualize this number, so we're going to take the annualized cost of protection. That's going to give us uh, $20,000, which is the total cost divided by 10, because that's how long this is going to last for. So we're going to take this, divide by 10, and that, of course, gives, well, we got to actually solve it, uh, of course, gives us $2,000. Okay. So we're still not quite done yet because we had the likelihood of occurrence before given as uh, basically 5% happen every 20 years. Now it's going to happen every 100 years. So it's going to be changed to 1%. And new annualized cost of occurrence. Or you could say cost of occurrence would protect. Whatever you want to do here is fine. Uh, we're just going to take that 100,000 because cost of occurrence has not changed uh, times likelihood, which is now 1%. And that gives us, of course, uh, $1,000. So now if we want to calculate the total annualized cost with protection, we're just going to take uh, total cost of protection, uh, total annualized cost of protection of $2,000 add it in with the new annualized cost of occurrence, which is $1,000, gives us 3000 Okay, so now we want to see which one of these options is more advantageous. So since the uh, annualized cost of occurrence without protection is $5,000. I was going to say Yippee Yarn should uh, use the protection which has total annualized cost of $3,000. Okay, so Basically, that's all you're doing is you're just trying to get the two numbers to the same sort of uh, unit. And there's a lot of different ways you could do that. Um, this is just a really simple way. Uh, one thing I'll make note of on this problem in particular, uh, you see how they had 25000 in lost business and restitution in 75000 So on the exam, you may see it to where uh, it's possible that maybe the 
lost business would stick around, but the restitution would uh, go away. So basically restitution would be things like um, anything where they had some sort of a governmental fee or some sort of regulation problem that they had to deal with. So it's possible that could certainly be the case on the exam where you may see that, but that'll be given in the problem. So if that is given in the problem, all you would do is when you're calculating down here, the uh, new annualized cost of occurrence, instead of doing the full uh, 100,000, you just change this to whatever the new annualized cost of, uh, new just cost of occurrence would be. So if the cost of occurrence changes, all you have to do is just change it there. Uh, with that out of the way though, that's really all we uh, are gonna cover for risk management. I uh, certainly hope that that made a lot of sense. If it doesn't, I welcome any questions. Uh, certainly, uh, next class, I will be glad to address any questions. Hopefully, we'll be back on campus. Uh, we'll see what the roads do. Uh, weather's looking a little bit iffy. So, certainly uh, hope to see you all Thursday in person. Have a great day.